Welcome to the webinar where we will be getting you ready for the new duty imposed on you as employers to prevent sexual harassment. Thank you for attending. My name's Roxy Gibson, so I'm the IT manager um, at Gilio and an associate member of the CIPD, who are also the professional body for HR learning and development. So here's the um, agenda today. So the main reason for this session, I want you to leave today feeling confident that you understand your new responsibility as employers to prevent sexual harassment and what steps you need to take to demonstrate compliance to the new or, or the updated legislation. Um, I do want to acknowledge at this point before we go any further that even though HR um, and supporting businesses and people is my expertise, I get it that this topic can feel like a minefield. Um, it's constantly evolving um, and I get that. Um, but rest assured that we're here to support you through this change now and going forward. So the um, agenda today will cover the legislation. Um, we'll look at defining sexual harassment. Who is affected? different types of sexual harassment, um, importantly, the impact, risks and costs to businesses, your responsibilities as an employer, and then your key takeaways. So, you know, what, what is it that you need to do leaving this webinar um, to make sure that you're compliant? And then obviously at the end, you'll get um, the opportunity to ask questions as well if you haven't asked any throughout. So let's have a look at what is actually changing. From the 26th of October, there's been, there will be an amendment to the Equality Act 2010, which strengthens the existing protection that's already in, pl um, in place for workers. And it puts a new duty um, or obligation, if you like, on employers to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment on their employees. Previously, there was no proactive uh, legal obligation for employers to take steps to prevent sexual harassment. So that's the biggest change. It's about the, the prevention and that is now a legal obligation. As well as the new legal obligation on employers, employment tribunals now have the um, power to uplift sexual harassment compensation by up to 25% if an employer is found to have breached this new duty. So this could be really significant as the most serious cases of sexual harassment can exceed £50,000. And this marks a key change in focus from in the legislation from redress to prevention what this means for you as employers. So an employer must now take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment of employees in their course of employment. Employers will need to be able to demonstrate if challenged during a tribunal that proactive measures have been put in place to prevent sexual harassment. This new legislation marks one of the most significant updates in more than a decade and extends to England, Wales and Scotland. Okay, let's have a look at what the definition that is set out in the Equality Act. So what is sexual harassment? So the law set out says in section 26, sexual harassment is defined as unwanted conduct, specific, specifically of a sexual nature or related to gender reassignment and has the purpose or effect of creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment for the complainant or, viol or violating his or her dignity. Now that's all well and good, but what does that actually mean? So what is sexual harassment? So here you can see some examples of sexual harassment. Some I'm sure you would agree are more obvious than others, um, but I'm going to pick out an example to talk, to talk about, um, and I'm gonna use the one of touching someone, for example, hugging them. Uh, the reason I've chosen this one is um, I think it's probably one of the less obvious examples of, of sexual harassment and can be quite tricky to navigate. Uh, I was only having a conversation last week with um, my colleague who I think is on this um, on this webinar about how you have managed this if you are like them, a hugger. So uh, we do have to be um, mindful in the in the workplace. Um, maybe more than we have in previous years because the legislation is constantly evolving and changing. So we do need to be more mindful. Um, with that being said, in this uh, specific scenario, you would need to use your judgment. So an example I'll give you, if you're meeting a colleague for the first time, it's probably unlikely, um, it, well, it's probably most likely to be unsuitable to go in for a hug and you might instead offer a handshake. If, however, you've built up a good relationship with a colleague um, already, but are maybe just meeting face to face for the first time, then hugging them may feel appropriate to you. However, you should still ask their permission and allow them to accept or decline. 
Now, you know, that sounds very formal. It doesn't have to be formal. Um, simply by saying to somebody as you meet them, you know, if you well them, if you know them well enough and you feel that, you know, a hug would actually be appropriate, you could say to that person, oh, you know, it's great to meet you. I'm a hugger. How about you? You've asked permission in a very natural, informal way. Um, so there is still a way to deal with that, to deal with this situation uh, without it feeling contrived. So who decides if the um, uh, behaviour is appropriate or acceptable? So an individual decides on what is unwanted behaviour and what is acceptable or not. This behaviour can be one off. Unwanted behaviour can be witnessed or overheard. It doesn't matter whether the conduct is acceptable to others or is, is common in the workplace. It's how the individual feels about it. Sexual conduct that has been welcomed in the past can become unwanted. Who is protected? The law protects the following people. So um, as you, you'd probably expect, employees are protected. Workers and agency workers are protected. So these are people with um, a contract to do work or provide services. Apprentices are protected. Some self-employed people will, will receive protection. Uh, protection applies to self-individuals where the person has to personally perform the work. Um, for example, in dental, this could be associates, hygienists, orthodontists. So for our industry, we assume the majority, if not all self-employed individuals are protected. One of the group that you might not necessarily think about being protected um, are job applicants. So it's important to remember this when recruiting. I'm just going to cover off um, some results of a um, of the sexual harassment survey that the government completed in uh, 2020, just so you can get an idea of um, of what this looks like nationally. Nearly three quarters, and that's 72 percent of the UK population, experienced at least one form of sexual harassment in their lifetime. I think you'd agree that that's that's a staggering statistic, but unfortunately, um, it's probably not surprising. The three most commonly experienced sexual harassment that come out of this survey were unwelcome sexual jokes, staring or looks and sexual comments. I've also picked out from this survey um, that there were certain demographic groups that were significantly more likely to have experienced one form of sexual harassment. These include women, young people, ethnic minorities, LGBTQIA plus individuals, and those with disabilities. Let's have a look at the impacts of sexual harassment. Starting off with the employee. So um, I think the impacts that I've listed there are probably what you would expect to see from somebody who's experienced sexual harassment. So that person may feel guilt, anger, humiliation. They, uh, they might, there may be emotional and psychological harm which could manifest as stress, depression, anxiety. Um, you could notice that they, they start to withdraw, so we would refer to that as lack of engagement. Um, so where this individual might have been actively involved in meetings, social events, you may see a, a shift in that, um, that behaviour and they may start to withdraw um, and not be involved in those um, events as much. And as you would expect that uh, to be, there would be a reduced job satisfaction as well for the individual. So what's the cost to the business? Come on, that's really important. So the cost to the business is not just the cost of the claim. It's not just a financial, um, it's not just a financial challenge that you'd have to face as a business. It's also the time that you would have to spend um, defending, defending that claim. So um, and also, you know, the, the cost, the cost is is extortionate. In the UK, all discrimination claims, um, damages for sexual harassment are uncapped. Um, and as I mentioned previously, with the tribunals now having the power to be able to increase that compensation by 25%, um, if that obligation, if the new obligation hasn't been met, you know, it's it's a, it's a significant amount of money um, and cost to the business that could have um, detrimental impact. Um, as you'd expect to see, turnover is impacted. So unsurprisingly, when um, affected um, individuals um, will consider whether they want to stay at the company, if they feel that things aren't being managed and dealt with, then it's likely that they might leave. Um, and then this has a knock-on impact on the rest of the team as well. So if other team members don't feel that it was handled in an appropriate way, then they may um, think that actually this isn't the place that they want to be in and consider leaving as well. The real big one, real big impact here for business is um, reputational damage and very hard to recover from. 
Um, as to be expected, um, if an employee isn't as, as engaged, uh, unlikely to be um, as productive. Um, so, you know, the, the, com the, the company themselves will see lower productivity from the individual and potentially other team members as well. Um, and as you'd expect, you'd expect your um, sickness to be higher. You'd have absenteeism from um, affected employees. So, um, you know, your, your sickness will be higher as well. I've picked a, um, a short video to watch. It's a five minute video. Um, it gives you the opportunity to hear firsthand experience of employees who were subjects of um, sexual harassment. So I'm just gonna play that video now for us to watch. Um, and then we'll have a, um, a little chat um, about that afterwards. So I'm just switching to the video now. A number of former McDonald's employees are taking legal action against the fast food chain after a BBC investigation exposed a toxic culture of sexual harassment, racism and bullying. The firm's UK chief executive, Alistair McCrow, said he is determined to root out any behaviour that fell short of the high standards expected at the company. Our correspondent, Zoe Conway, reports. Ed is studying for his A-levels. He started a new job at McDonald's at the beginning of the year. Very soon, one of the senior managers at the store repeatedly pestered him for sex. Ed was 16. This happened in front of others when he would pass it off his banter, uh, but then behind closed, door, behind closed doors in the fridge or the crew room or the stock room when no one else was there, uh, he would very much give the impression that he was being absolutely serious. And it's gross, it's disgusting, and it's horrifying that uh, someone with that much power um, in the workplace could say something like that to a 16-year-old such as myself. The harassment went on for several months until Ed quit in April. I was really upset. Um, it did take a toll on my mental health. Um, there were some shifts after that where actually I would get really upset about going in uh, to work and I would cry a lot before my shift uh, shifts and uh, yeah. In July, a BBC investigation revealed that more than 100 current and recent McDonald's employees alleged a toxic culture of sexual assault, harassment, racism and bullying at the company. Several McDonald's workers told the BBC that they were too scared to complain to managers because they didn't think they would be believed. You went to a senior manager and asked for help. What happened? I tried to explain to a senior manager that someone who was much older than me was uh, sexually harassing me and making sexual comments to me. I was then informed by the person I tried to report it to that if they had any more about this, um, I would face severe consequences, including not being eligible for a promotion. Ed is one of a number of ex-McDonald's workers who are taking the company to court. It could be the first Me Too group action in the UK. Following the BBC investigation, we were contacted by a number of people um, asking if they had legal recourse. And on examination, there were some clear themes that were coming through about the way McDonald's practices and systems were happening. And in particular, in relation to how vulnerable the youngest workers at McDonald's are. And we felt that they should, McDonald's should be held accountable by this young group of people. After the BBC investigation into McDonald's was broadcast in July, another 160 people contacted us with allegations of bullying and harassment, and 200 people contacted the Equality Watchdog, the EHRC, with their complaints. Several current employees have told us that the workplace culture at McDonald's has not changed much since July. Steve Reed contacted the BBC in July about what he said was a sexist and bullying culture at the store his daughters worked at. Liv decided to quit at the beginning of the summer. She says one of the senior managers was openly racist about a new employee. There was a member of staff fairly new to the store about two or three weeks in and she was Sikh and pretty much um, there was a comment made about how it was her type of people that bomb us. Hearing something like that disgusted me because I don't get how you can, you're supposed to be 
almost setting an example for people, but you're openly and freely saying stuff like this. Izzy, you're still working there. Yeah. Has it changed since Liv left? It's exactly the same. The behaviour is still, as she left, exactly the same. It hasn't changed. It's meant to be a friendly environment and it's not. It's just the language that is there, it's just, it's unacceptable. It's heartbreaking. What's really the worst thing is probably that nothing's been done about it. Nothing's changed, you know, since July. In a statement, Alistair McCrow, the CEO of McDonald's UK and Ireland, said, I am completely determined to root out any behaviour that falls below the high standards of respect, safety and inclusion we demand of everyone at McDonald's. That is why in July I immediately ordered measures to address critical areas we needed to strengthen. I initiated a company-wide programme of independent investigations, auditing of our complaints processes, reviews of our codes of conduct and, in a number of cases, full disciplinary hearings. While we're confident in the first steps we've taken, I'm determined to understand what more we can do and our efforts will need to be far-reaching and constantly evolving. McDonald's prides itself on employing one of the youngest workforces in the country. Its critics say it's failing in its duty to keep them safe. Zoe Conway, BBC News. Right, so I appreciate that it's a completely different industry to to what we work in, but the reason I wanted to um, show you that video is I think it really um, shows the impact of um, the impact it can have on um, employees when um, HR, more specifically, sexual harassment allegations is not managed effectively. So how can we avoid being in the headlines? So let's move on to what you can practically do to get your practice ready. Just before we cover off the actions that you can take to demonstrate compliance, I think it's important for us to understand your responsibility in relation to sexual harassment as the employer. So this duty falls on all employers and isn't limited to size or type of organisation. If challenged during an employment tribunal relating to a sexual harassment claim, um, an employer would need to be able to demonstrate by providing evidence that you've taken all reasonable steps to prevent the employee from doing the alleged act of discrimination. So next, we're going to take a look at what would be deemed as reasonable steps. What is it that you actually have to do to be, to be able to demonstrate your compliance? As expected, when there's this type of legislation change, there is no definition of, of reasonable steps. So, you know, they haven't stated what exactly what reasonable steps you would need to take, um, but they will be interpreted as, as actions that are practical, proportionate and tailored to the circumstances of the workplace. Now, reasonable steps may look different in every sector and in every type of business, actually. Um, but we have reviewed what we believe are reasonable steps for our industry, the dental industry, and recommend the following four key areas of focus to demonstrate your compliance. So probably not surprising to hear policies, policies, policies. It's essential that you have an appropriate policy in place that is followed in relation to conduct in this area. So setting out expected behaviours and how concerns or allegations will be dealt with. Um, so this policy needs to be regularly reviewed. Um, and if you're an iComply or IT member, um, there's a policy already in place there that you can use that is fit for purpose, um, the anti-bullying and harassment policy. Um, it also forms part of the iComply cycle. So the review is built in, which makes it a lot easier for you. Uh, non iComply members will need to ensure that you have a similar policy in place, um, or you can speak to us about how iComply or IT can support you in this area. So step two is around culture. So this one's this one's a bit tricky. It's a bit more challenging because it's more of a feeling rather than you having to necessarily, you know, do do these things and you will change your culture. It, I, it's not that simple, unfortunately. But one way um, to help you on your way to building a positive workplace culture is by having the right policies in place, the right training, which I'll go on to in just a second. Um, you know, following all of these steps, following steps one, three and four, all support and um, help you on your way to building a positive culture.
Step three, very important, in you need to provide training. So you need to invest in an ongoing training programme to educate your employees about what is acceptable workplace behaviour and the consequences of harassment. Um, Agilio do offer a CPD course on the Essentials platform in ILEM um, that would cover this. Um, if, you don't, um, if you don't subscribe to that, then you'll need to make sure that you provide appropriate training to your team um, and your, your managers around how they have to deal with such allegations. So the, the final step, step four, is about investigating allegations and having a zero tolerance approach. So, you know, we've, we've, we've heard that um, phrase thrown, thrown around quite a lot, but, you know, this is really important um, and, you know, that this, needs to be a, uh, this needs to be applied. You need to ensure that there are effective mechanisms in place for addressing and investigating complaints promptly and impartially. You can use the grievance investigation record um, in iComply if you're if you're an iComply IT member. Um, if you're not an iComply IT member, then you just need to develop a template for capturing these investigations. By understanding the new by understanding the new requirements, um, defining reasonable steps, and implementing these proactive measures employees can contribute to a safe and more inclusive working environment and importantly be able to demonstrate your compliance to the new legislation so this is the really important part now you know this this is the what do you need to do this is essentially the actions you need to take to be able to demonstrate that from the 26th of october you are actively taking steps to prevent sexual harassment in your practices so let's just recap the previous slide what are the reasonable steps you need to take Number one, again, you need to regularly review your policies. I comply and IT members can use the anti-bullying policy that I've mentioned previously. If you don't subscribe to these products, then you need to make sure that you have a similar product, uh, similar policy in place that is compliant with the legislation. Um, if after you perform investigations, you um, feel that um, the conduct is um, it needs to be investigated. Needs to be investigated further. Then you can use the disciplinary policy for any any allegations of misconduct. Um, so again, I comply. And IT members can um, use the template that's available. Um, if you're not, if you don't have these products, then um, you'll need to make sure that you have a um, policy in place to cover this. Number two is about fostering a positive workplace culture. So by following these steps, um, you will help to contribute to building that positive workplace culture. It's not everything that will um, you know, build that positive workplace place culture, but it definitely supports that. You need to invest in ongoing training programs to educate employees um, about the acceptable behaviour and consequences of harassment. Um, so Agilio do offer a CPD course on um, the Essentials platform um, in iLearn. Um, so that's going to become available shortly. Um, if you don't have iLearn, then you will need to make sure that the appropriate training is in place for um, all employees and managers, um, specifically around how they would manage um, and um, investigate any um, sexual harassment claims. Step four, establish effective mechanisms for addressing and investigating complaints. So you can use the um, grievance investigation form in iComply if you subscribe to iComply or iTeam to record these investigations. Um, if you're not a member of those products, then you need to make sure that you've got an appropriate template to capture these conversations and investigations. So sorry to hammer home the point, but final recap, there's four steps, policies, culture, training, investigating and addressing. And if you follow these four steps and put them into practice, you will be complying with the new responsibility put on employers to prevent sexual harassment. And most importantly, be able to demonstrate, if challenged, you have met the new duty put on employers to prevent sexual harassment. So just before we move on to uh, questions. I wanted to take the opportunity to showcase and highlight the I team benefits. Um, probably might be a little bit biased, seeing as it's my team, but you know, they are fantastic. And I thought, whilst I've got the opportunity, I wanted to share that. So, not only can I team support you with navigating the challenging world of employment law legislation changes like this one, um, and the upcoming employment law agenda that Labour is proposing, the fantastic team um, that I look after um, of experienced dental-specific HR advisors can help with all of those things that are, are mentioned there. It's an invaluable service um, and if you want to know more about iTeam or the other mentioned products in this webinar then please click on the uh, link to speak to us. 
So that does bring us to an end. Um, so I just really want to thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. And I do hope that you found it valuable. And now you feel confident and equipped with how you are going to proactively prevent sexual harassment and you understand your new duty. Thank you. Bye.